grab all the women, a lot of the women's uh, artworks for uh, Bonaire and beyond, like uh, Rachel said. So we put some different uh, pieces in the modernist gallery, mainly that's the big change, and there's a couple of pottery pieces that changed a little bit. But um, this piece, I have to remember his name, Charles Mullen, Elegant Woman Walking with Leashed Panthers from 1925. So it's right in the uh, early 20th century modernist piece, and I think that the panther goes well with the Jove Panthers that we have on the other wall. Uh, it's Art Deco at its finest. This was a, a Charles Mullen was a, a um, illustrator, so this is a painting that was turned into an illustration. Um, then you want to go to the Brigade, the little here, the little pond. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to get a little bit of a cultural voice in the modernist room, and people seem to forget that uh, Native American people were painting, working, doing shows during the early 20th century. Um, in New York, in different places, but um, one of the places where um, Native art was really developing was in Santa Fe. Um, and I don't know, has anyone here heard of Dorothy Dunn and the uh, Santa Fe Indian School? I told, <laughs> I told Lori. But it's now um, the American Institute for Indian and Alaskan Arts that's in Santa Fe. It's the college that's there, and a lot of artists have trained there. Fritz Shoulder train there. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of Fritz Shoulder. Uh, fun fact, Fritz Shoulder's, one of his uh, paintings in the Hindman auction took the highest price for a native, a contemporary native, or considered contemporary native artist, $500,000. One of his paintings just sold for. It was estimated at fifty to 60000 wow. so it blew up. <laughs> um, but um, I wanted to uh, put out some examples of the, the Santa Fe uh, Indian School. Um, this is Harrison Begay. He studied with Alan Hauser, actually. Um, around the same time, Harrison Begay is Navajo. And this flat style, studio style, um, it's something that's familiar to people who study Native, native art, and contemporary Native art. Um, and it's got a certain, this book is Dorothy Dunn's book about her students. But there's certain conventions in this that are um, typical, like you see the deer is the flat style. This relates to, you know, images you see on pottery, uh, high paintings, uh, kiva paintings, things like that. And the, like the, the leaves, there's a certain um, way that they did foliage, they did uh, geographical features um, uniquely. Um, you can recognize usually people who are working in the studio style. A lot of them were uh, Pueblo and Nav Navajo people that came to this school. Um, and uh, I taught at I AI for about three years online, and my students were all Native students too. And I was teaching them contemporary art. Um, and it was great experience and great people there. Um, do you want to show Alan Hauser's? So this one's, I'm guessing, from about the 1950s. We don't have a date on it. This uh, bison, Alan Hauser was a modernist. Um, he started working in 1939, and uh, um, I think then he went into the military and came back and continued. He, he does a lot of paintings too, but he got into sculpting. Um, in fact, I think the story goes, um, my professor knew him very well, one of my professors knew him very well, uh, and he um, got a block of marble and they said, carve this block of marble. And he <laughs> didn't really know how to carve, but he did carve a, a native person, kind of a blockish style. But he was influenced by modernist artists. There is one artist called Raymond, named Raymond Johnson, Johnson who um, influenced a lot of, uh, an abstract artist that influenced a lot of the um, artists that came from the Indian school and that college. And Alan Hauser's. So was one of the founding teachers of IAI. So that's how he relates to modernism. This is from 1990, so it's a little later, but you can still see that the style, it's very stylized of a bison, and I think it's really beautiful. So I'll put up a sign there. If you have any questions, if you don't, feel free to come and talk to me. I love to talk about art. So, um, Gigi. Is the Bonaire exhibit open now? It will be open on the fourth officially. We're having a big party on the third, the evening of the third.
of June. And so a next sneak week peek in the morning as well. Oh, and yeah, sneak peek at 11:30 next Friday. But I'm excited about that one. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, that's going to be really fun. So we're finishing it up this coming week. Great. Thank you, Tammy. Thanks. Yeah, everybody should get out there um, while you're here today and see these because they're, they're pretty cool. I like them. Yep. Thanks, Rachel. Yep. Okay. Okay, so up next I see Stephanie's here. <laughs> so I'll hand it over to Stephanie. Um, with updates from programs and events. I do. Um, that was actually a perfect segue into our first uh, programs and events uh, event that we're going to have next Friday. So we are still looking for volunteers for that. But I just know and I'll let her. Well, I guess I can talk about it a little. Um, the June 3rd event will be 5 to 7, so it's a two-hour event, just kind of meant to do, um, yep, yeah, perfect, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, it's to celebrate our 35th anniversary this year, as well as the Bonner opening, um, and then we'll have Sloshy, Sliders, and Strum Bucket, so uh, that's the tagline we have for this event. Um, it's free and open to the public for all ages, uh, so Palette will provide lemonade, um, non-alcoholic drinks for purchase, as well as sliders, <coughs> so mini sliders. Um, and then we have Strum Bucket playing music for the two hours, as well as TLS is providing um, small sloshies. Um, and that's kind of token based, so we are looking for Clickers and greeters, basically um, someone on each end of the amphitheater to uh, click in people as well as hand out slider tokens. Um, so everything's kind of like token based except for the non-alcoholic drinks, which are for purchase. Um, and then Plan Air Fest, our annual Plan Air Fest on June 18th, which is Saturday before Father's Day. Um, we, it'll be from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. open to the public, but of course with staff and volunteer help, it'll be a much earlier start and then, um, breakdown. Um, so we do, all, I have a sign-up sheet on the back table also with some openings for that event. Um, music will be by Chan Man. We have palette catering, um, for purchase food, um, and of course the silent auction for the plein air and al fresco style paintings that will be um, up for auction on that day. Uh, free admission to uh, the public for the galleries and for the event. And it might be good to explain the difference this year between the plein air category and the al fresco yes. category. If you can do Absolutely. So the two categories are plein air and al fresco. So we are trying to adhere to the traditional plein air. Uh, for the best in show qualification. Plan air meaning that the majority of the artwork is created in an outdoor location here within Teton County. They, the artists can paint off site, but they must finish the piece on site to engage the public and talk about the process, talk about their painting, um, and encourage the sell, selling of their painting. Um, the second category, um, we're, we're mostly just naming the categories this year, but so al fresco, an artist may paint what they want. Um, they can rely on photographic references exclusively if they wanted to. So for example, um, Nicolette Ma always does kind of bright colored animals. Um, she does like, I think last year she did like a really big moose. Um, definitely not plein air but we want to encourage the local artists to be here and be present as they have in the past. Um, they will still be part of the auction, but they wouldn't qualify for best in show. Um, plan air artists as well need to have their canvas stamped to participate in best in show. So we have different time um, frames before, like on the Friday before and the morning of Saturday for artists to come in to get their canvas stamped. Um, I also do have a couple handouts. Um, I didn't print out too many, but if you guys want all these details, I can, and a timeline, um, I can hand those out to you, or I can email. Um, and everything else is pretty much the same. For those who have never worked at Plein Air, um, or been
akin to a plein air event. Um, the silent auction aspect is where the artist will bring in or turn in their finished piece um, to our curators. They'll hang them up onto our artwork displays and then they determine the starting bid point of their piece. And then once the silent auction begins, the public can start writing in their name and the up bid. Every up bid goes into increments of $25. And then at the end of the silent auction, which we'll call um, that final bottom uh, highest bid wins that piece. Um, so yeah, we do still have um, availability for that. And then, of course, what, what oh, and then, sorry. Oh, well, I was going to say, um, training for Planar Fest, if people want to volunteer with that, they need to come to a specific Planar tra Fest training, which is usually the day before, like Friday, or do you have a different plan? So, this year, thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. Um, this year, we usually do it the day before, but that day before is always our board member meeting, mm -hmm. so it's a bit tight for staff and for volunteers and for our staff to, like, get the training really tightened up. So we're going to do it on the Thursday before Saturday. Um, Michelle and I are working out to do two time, two, um, time frames for training, um, one in the morning and one in the afternoon. That way we can get as many people in as possible to get that training done. We're going to train volunteers and staff um, during those timelines. So uh, if you do plan on volunteering, please try and keep that Thursday free. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah. And I'll also send out a more solid email to all volunteers, of course, um, with all those details. Moving on to Western Visions. So, as part of our 35th anniversary of Western Visions and of the museum, um, this is also, by the way, our new header for this year. We are, Anglia is the, uh, the wolf, whereas last year was the elk. Um, and we're em em emphasizing the blue. Um, new this year, which I know every year it kind of changes a little bit. <laughs> um, we, in honor of our 35th anniversary, we are also adding a live auction component. Our goal is to have 35 artists um, participate in the live auction aspect. Um, but we, and so we're still kind of working on that 35, but we have over 30 artists so far. Um, and then we have an, our normal intent to purchase for the smaller size formats, same as last year. Um, so it's more enhanced. Um, the live auction aspect actually is also, there's no size limit. Um, so that is also a difference. That will be in the King Gallery. Um, size of the item you mean? Oh, sorry, sorry, size of the piece. So the sculpture or the, the painting. Sorry. Um, and then... We are also starting the intent to purchase entries uh, early, like mid-August or so. So as soon as we get all the artwork images in and we can release all the images to the public on our Western Visions website, people can start putting in their intent to purchase name, like their name for intent to purchase. Um, and then also new is that after the whole event, there's going to be a dessert reception in honor of our 35th. Is there no food? There is food. There's um, like like um, heavy apps and cocktails and beverages, but um, this is just what's new. Um, but yeah, we usually do heavy apps and um, reception style. Um, and then we are also looking for gallery guides um, for the People's Choice Award, as or as well as the People's Choice Award coordinator um, during the exhibit opening between uh, the 10th, September 10th and September 15th. September 15th is the day of the event. Um, and then we also, of course, need a lot of volunteer help on the day of the event, which is uh, Thursday, September 15th. Um, and then we also hope that you would promote our Western Visions and encourage sales and purchases. Um, for the event. I also do have, let's see, how much time do we have? Oh, you're fine on time. It's 1020, it looks like. Okay. Um, Michelle, who unfortunately is out of town taking care of her in-laws, she 
was not able to make this um, meeting. So she gave me some information that she wanted me to share. Um, additionally, um, she wants to mention that, um, so like last year, the bidding and or entry process can be conducted in person, online, or by proxy. So we're going to still maintain those three options for participation uh, for Western Visions. Um, and they will all require the purchase of a ticket, $195 for in-person, $100 for online, $100 for proxy. Um, the live auction aspect will be also available online through two websites, invaluable.com and liveauctioneers.com, but it will not be a video live streamed event. Um, no ticket is required for a live auction, however, for that online participation, because usually it's a membership based and you have to pay to be a part of those online um, auctioneer. Um, we're, we'll be still using paddles with QR codes, again like last year, for an electronic drawing for intent to purchase. Still no boxes on the wall and no bid books. Um, the buyer's premium, 20% will apply for the live auction and the first round of intent to purchase drawings. This helps to cover shipping costs, credit card fees, and staff labor costs surrounding those two divisions. Um, they're 20%. You, you said 20%? Yeah. For all the purchases at Western Divisions, or just that? Yeah. Uh, for uh, live auction for and live. first round of intent to purchase. Mm -hmm. So the night so, of intent to purchase. So. Um, 10% flat fee will apply for post-event sales, and then our goal is to raise $302,000 in profit. Um, and then, kind of a brief schedule, um, exhibit opens September 10th. Uh, the, we will have a private morning tour on Tuesday uh, the 13th, and then on Wednesday the 14th, there's an artist panel discussion uh, the overarching theme is the intersection of relationships and art. Um, no other details at this time regarding the artist discussion. Um, also on Wednesday is the artist reunion reception from 5 to 7, and then the event show and sale on Thursday the 15th. Post sales begin on Friday the 16th, so the morning after the event. And then Sunday, October 2nd is the last day of the exhibit um, sale exhibit and sale. So yeah, um, I do, like I said, I do have a couple handouts of all the details that I just mentioned, um, <coughs> and you'll be seeing plenty of emails forthcoming as well. Great. And then, thank you so much for everyone who helped us out last year uh, for Plan Air, um, and we hope to see you again this year. Great, thank you. Any questions for Stephanie? Oh. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so next on my agenda, I had Debbie and Mike Hoffings, who's not here, but Debbie, do you have any updates for us? Okay. So really quickly, I hope everyone's had a chance to see the new museum store now that it's been finished with the remodel. We're very pleased with it. It turned out really, really well. Had a few little delays towards the end, but we made it for our grand opening on May 1. For the last fiscal year, which ended April 30th, mm -hmm. I thought I would share with you that admissions finished about $190,000 over its goal for the year. So a great job to Stephen and Danny in particular. Mm -hmm. And despite being closed for three and a half months, the shop finished $40,000 over its goal. Wow, so wow. <laughs> But as we all know, everybody came out west last, last two years. <laughs> It was an extremely busy year. Um, I have given uh, Rachel a little job description for admissions and the shop. We would love if anyone would like to help us out on a volunteer basis this summer. Um, you'll be pleased to know that the new software we use is really amazing. It's so much simpler than the old system and everyone's loving the front end of the software, I would say. The back end of it, we're still having some challenges, but the front end is really simple. So if everyone, anyone would like to help, we'd love to hear from you. Um, admissions any day of the week would be great, but in particular Thursdays and Fridays. 
and same for the shop, in particular Thursdays and Fridays would be really helpful to us. Those are the days that we have the, the least staffing available. So. Um, and I think that's it. Oh, I went to a Museum Store Association conference last week and it was really interesting because as with museums and the AAM, they're now talking a lot about DEAI, sustainability, decolonizing your museum. We had all the same topics except they applied to museum stores. So it was really interesting to see how they're pushing that for us to be cognizant of these topics and adopt them into the store as well. And um, there was a lot of sessions all at once. We didn't get to see them all, but they were videoing them, so we'll be able to watch them afterwards, and I'll be sharing them with my staff as well, so they will have a chance to, to watch this and be aware of what was going on. Other than that, it was great to see people after two-year absence like everywhere else. It's nice to reconnect with people. I reconnected with a shop manager that used to work here. I think the only person she remembered from here was Jane Labino. And she had a chance to catch up with Jane one morning for breakfast. She was a shop manager probably about 15, 16 years ago, so it was great to see her. So, um, yeah, it was wonderful. And if anyone has any questions, please come and see me. If you're interested in volunteering, please also reach out to Danny. He's a great one to talk to and very helpful. And does anyone have any questions? Abby, yeah, what was the name of the shop manager? Stacy Stackhouse. Stacy. <laughs> Oh, yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> she thought the only one she remembered was Wendy. I was so I almost fired her. Oh my god. Stacy went to the shape. Yeah, this is good to see. So, any questions, everyone? Yeah. Yeah. All right, thank you. And you've all been introduced to Tanya, so we're very happy to have her on board. She'll be working with us Wednesday through Saturday, Sunday. And if anyone recognizes Tanya's face, she was in power for a while. Yes, yeah. so oh, yeah. I recognize her. So we're very happy to have her on board. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Great. Rachel. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you, Debbie. Yeah, the shop Debbie. was amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll be there for the shop. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so did you want to talk? Um, yeah, perfect. Elizabeth's going to come on up and give us um, some updates from the advancement department. I don't know why my screen isn't showing anymore. I was going to pull up the website to show that aspen tree oh, that would be great. stuff on here. But do you know how to, um, how do I find that mirroring? Sometimes I need to adjust that. But it's weird because it was showing it earlier. And I didn't touch anything. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everyone. You all met Willow a few minutes ago. Great. So we are doing a new um, fundraising initiative where we're selling aspen trees you all may have noticed in our north parking lot, so the guest parking lot, in between the upper and lower area, there's a whole bunch of beautiful new aspen trees. They've planted 50, and we plan on planting another 25. So our goal is to have a donor plant an aspen tree, and we're selling them for $2,000 an aspen tree. And this is really a name recognition opportunity. We're going to put a plaque adjacent to the aspen trees. Willow and I have been scheming the perfect location for that. So this is not all finalized exactly what that piece will look like. Um, we've had a lot of interest from families that are getting an aspen tree in memory of a loved one, which is kind of beautiful. So a lot of the name recognitions are going to be um, it's like the, the person who's purchasing the tree and then in memory of their family member. So we're picturing um, a relatively large plaque. You guys can think about the signage that we already have on the sculpture trail, the fire signage, and also the signage about the ecosystem. And so it's going to match that in kind of scale. And then we're picturing the donor recognitions in um, alphabetical order on the sign. So. We're excited about this. This is something that our facilities team really wanted. I know when I've walked the sculpture trail in the summer, I've noticed a lot of families enjoying picnicking, and so this will allow there to be a little bit more shade um, to have a good spot to picnic, and also offer shade for the cars. Um, another neat kind of anecdote about the aspen trees in our location is back when the fire did happen up on the hillside, I know a few people mentioned that that grove of aspen trees that's kind of up above us 
worked as a fire like suppressant. Aspens hold a lot of water in their leaves, so they're actually a great tree to plant as kind of helping mitigate um, some of those grass fires that we have certainly seen right here. So um, we're going to leave some little, just little flyers about this, but as you are here this summer, if you hear people asking questions about the aspen trees, it's almost hard to tell that they're new because they're so big. We're excited about the size of them. Um, so if you hear people asking questions about those or if any of you want to be involved, please ask Willow or myself. We hope to be able to um, talk this up a little bit during plain air and some of the other events that we have this summer. So you guys can kind of help point people towards the development team if you see someone that might be interested in that or if any of you have interest in participating. Um, we're really excited about this initiative. Like I said, there's there $2,000 per tree and just so you guys know, um, 500 of that is what's really covering the like the facility, like the actual tree, and then helping with the sculpture trail kind of maintenance of that. And then 1500 is going into operating, like we put that into operating budget. So this is definitely a fundraiser that we're doing to help support this next fiscal year. The plan will be is we'll also run this same fundraiser next year with an additional group of trees. So, yeah, any questions about that? We're excited for it. Yeah, who's supplying them? Who's supplying them? Yeah. Who's supplying them? Yeah. I think growing green, I feel like, do, do any of you guys know growing, I want to growing say growing green, sounds growing right green is the me. name yeah. of the landscape yeah. company that we work with, and so they're who Robert has been working with um, to facilitate that. So this is really kind of a tandem project between our facilities team, Robert's been really helpful in getting um, you know, good trees in the ground, and then making sure that they're in part of the, you know, like larger landscaping are they up on They're there, yes. If you go in this park, in, in the, the guest parking lot, the north parking lot, there's a whole bunch of trees that are in between the upper and lower area that are all brand new. I know, I haven't even thought of that. I have three babies. I'm like, have been thinking about pitching that to my parents. Um, yeah, so it's, it's a fun naming opportunity. I mean, the goal, one of the reasons we don't have plaques on the individual trees is because we pictured this is more of like an in, in perpetuity. It's the donor aspen grove that we're asking support. So, you know, if a tree was to need to be replaced, it's not like someone's tree had to be replaced. So you're supporting the whole grove. <laughs> you're also talking about picnicking. Are there going to be more picnic tables? Robert actually put two picnic tables on the north side next to the trees. So there's, um, there's a little bit of a better picnic spot in that zone. Certainly more shade. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is nice. Yeah. Great. This doesn't have to do with trees, but it does have to do with the entrance out there. Um, I think it's looking a little shabby because the birds have got the birds. <laughs> it goes in, must come out. And somebody should make them should go out and clean it up because visitors come in there and it doesn't look very good. Yes, and I appreciate you bringing that up. That has been noted on the facilities and the maintenance team, and I know that they've been working hard on putting up some additional bird, you know, keeping the birds away. You'll you'll notice there's kind of a, a high pitched sound that I I mean I can hear. I've heard some people can hear it, and some can't, and that's to help keep the birds away from that zone. Um, but unfortunately, one of the things is is that the birds come back, and so it's something that needs to be addressed frequently. But we can certainly continue to share that that's a... And we do have a couple of groups, um, volunteer groups that come in in the spring almost every year. There's a group of like teenagers that Jane works with and they do a lot of scrubbing on handrails and they clean up a lot of that. So but yes, thank they'll you. be here that's probably in the spring again. Or I know summer. particularly before events from a mm -hmm. development side, we're trying to make sure we have events on everyone's schedule because, you know, as you point out, um, we don't want that to be the focal point before an event. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? So one of the challenges they had, John, if they put at the top of the underfoot for sure to stop the birds from being there, not spikes, but something like that. Mm -hmm. The ravens are so smart, they figured out how to get on the 
back side of it. So now they're having to go around and do a double throw because they just think, okay, you don't want to sit, we'll just do it. Too Oh great, so Rachel's pulled up, um, we have donor Aspen Grove information on the website. Thank you so much. Since for our website that. is new, I just wanted to make sure people can find it. So from the um, from the home page, here I'll go back and just show Thank everybody. Thank you, Rachel. Maybe. There it goes. Okay, so this is the home page. You go up here, you click support. Over here to ways to give. And then on these tabs here. There's the donor aspect of, and it'll scroll you down. Thank you for showing that. And we actually have had a few people that aren't local that have wanted to give online, and that's 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 great. So they they were able to give with their credit card through our online system, and then they just put a note in that it was for an aspen tree, and then we we will Will and I Will is going to follow up this summer to make sure we get all the name recognition is just right. Yes. I would like to take note of the new plantings that are at the curb. Have you seen them? Yes. yes. When we yeah. came in? Next to the sign. <clears throat> Next mm -hmm. to the sign, there are new plantings of trees. And it looks great. Well, that's so great to hear. I will make sure Robert hears that. He, I think, as I mentioned, as far as our world with the aspen trees, I know he's been putting thought into just the, the overall planting. So I'm glad to hear that you guys appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, great. Thanks, Elizabeth. All right, thank you guys. Yeah, the other cool thing about aspen trees is they bloom out around them. So that could be a whole family thought. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not just, you know, <laughs> the grandfather, it could be transmitted and that kind of thing. Because they do, they split and close all around them. They, they're interesting uh, breed of tree. Great. Okay. I will continue on down the agenda here um, with just some general sort of updates. Julia's not here today, although she was going to mention, um, most of you are familiar with the Women in Wildlife Art app that we've been working really hard on for, gosh, it seems like two years now. <laughs> um, so I'm sure Julia would just say thank you for everyone who has participated in that and to remind everyone that that is going to go live on June 3rd when Bonar and Beyond opens. And the title of the app, that's when it officially will be released in a celebratory way and we'll have um, some extra sort of activities um, on that opening event where people can use the app. So we finally decided on a title, which is Through Her Eyes. Um, so that is the, the name of that mobile app tour. So that was really hard and I don't know that it's perfect, but it works. And so that's good enough, right? <laughs> Titles are hard. Um, so we're excited about that app tour and hopefully you'll all get a chance to play with that. Um, I don't think we can play with it quite yet, but definitely by June 3rd. Um, I will briefly mention last year, some of you might remember some watercolor workshops that we did out on the Sculpture Trail, and we're going to do that again this year. So we're looking forward to that. We have three dates, July 9th, August, or July 23rd, and August 6th. Um, the artists are still to be determined. I believe Fred King was going to do it again. Um, I forget who the other one is, and then we need to find a third one. So just to kind of put that on your radar. Um, on the table, you'll find all kinds of things we printed off for you. Um, there's a couple um, extra copies of The Call of the Wild. You should have received that in the mail as members, but if you haven't gotten one or you want another copy for any reason, feel free to take one. Um, there's a nice couple of volunteer pages in there. Um, they did a really great job with Call of the Wild, um, so enjoy that. The other things that are on the table are um, an updated volunteer directory. If anyone wants a new photo, maybe we could arrange a date. Gigi says um, she's taken photos for, for this before and she's happy to do that if anyone would like an updated photo. Um, or if you want to keep your old one, that's all right too. It's up to you. But maybe in the future we can, uh, or maybe for the next quarterly, we can plan on that being a good one where you can bring your camera and then a lot of people are here. So and we can try that. That might be easier than planning another date. Um, so feel free to take that directory home. And there's also the uh, updated volunteer manual and a docent manual. One thing that I've been asking staff to, to do for us is to help me come up with writing some new um, sort of position descriptions or things that volunteers do or could do within their department um, to try to 
freshen things up a little bit, make some updates to the current ones, because we haven't made changes to those in a really long time. Um, and so a few staff have definitely done that, and so I've added that in the manual. Um, I forget what page it is, but the volunteer manual, there's a couple pages of, of new updated position descriptions that I hope will help volunteers get a little bit more excited and have a little bit more information about what kinds of things they can do within different departments. Um, as uh, Debbie mentioned, she wrote a nice one for me for admissions, so um, there's a copy of it here too, the admissions and the museum shot, but as I said, it's in that manual, so. And then, uh -huh. oh, the Volunteer Hospitality Fund, just a reminder that the purple tin back there on that table is for the Volunteer Hospitality Fund. If anybody wants to throw a couple of dollars in there today, I'll make sure and scoop that up um, right away after the meeting. Um, just for our Cards and Flowers Fund, we really appreciate having some, uh, some money there. Okay, so 10.43, good, we're in good shape time-wise. I will run through the, the boring part here, the upcoming things, trainings, events, social outings. Um, we have sneak peeks, two, two sneak peeks in June, June 3rd for Bunner and Beyond, and those are at 11.30 in the morning, they're half an hour long. Um, on June 3rd for Bunner and Beyond, celebrating women in wildlife art, we are excited to have two artists here for that sneak peek. So we'll have Mary Roberson and Rox Corbett, um, so that's going to be a really, really fun one. Don't miss it. I will record it, as I always do, but um, that should be a really fun um, pair to talk about women and wildlife art. Obviously, both of them have a piece in this exhibit, so that'll be fun. And then uh, June 24th will be a sneak peek, again at 11.30, for Above the Clouds, Art of the Alpine, which is our summer sort of community exhibit in the Wapiti Gallery. And we've got... I think over 30 pieces in that exhibit, and thanks to those who helped jury. I've heard that that was a fun project and you guys liked doing that, so thanks for, thanks for helping with that. Other trainings um, on the docket here, June 8th, which is a sort of our typical Wednesday training, although it's earlier in the month than I would normally do, but June 8th at 11 o'clock in the morning, I have people from Schmidt's Custom Framing coming to talk about frames. We've had a lot of requests for that in the last few years, so I'm glad that we're finally going to do a training on that. So hopefully you can learn a little bit more about frames and what they're for and what they do and why they are the way they are. And why they cost so much. And why they cost so much. That's a good question. <laughs> I think you'll find out why they cost so much. Um, and then Plain Air Fest training as... Uh, Stephanie mentioned will be Thursday before Planner Fest. I don't know my calendar, so I don't know what date that is. But the 16th, that sounds right. So look for more information on that. Social stuff, continuing education opportunities. Monday Musings is done for this year, but we'll restart in the fall because we've been having so much fun with that. Um, and then in the meantime, we'll kind of switch to our picnic format, which is kind of like Musings, but um, includes a, a picnic lunch, which you bring your own and we'll enjoy the new picnic tables over in the Aspen Groves. And so those are scheduled at 12 p.m. on the first and third Mondays of the month, June, July, August, um, which puts the June date as June 6th and June 20th. Um, book club, we're continuing. Um, we're gonna do one more meeting with Fox and I, um, which is a fun, pretty easy read. Doesn't take too long to plow through, although I haven't finished it yet still. Um, but we're going to meet on that one on June 13th at 1 p.m., and that can be here in the Members' Lounge or on Zoom, whichever you prefer. And then for the July book club, we're going to switch to Homo Aestheticus, where art comes from and why, which as an anthropology major, I love that stuff, so um, I have my copy already, um, and those copies are available at Valley Bookstore, too. So that should be a really fascinating one. And again, that's in person or on Zoom. And I do have one extra copy of each of those books in my office, if you want to borrow one. And then we'll start hiking in June as well. So hikes we have scheduled on Tuesdays, the second and fourth Tuesdays of the month. So that'll be June 14th and June 28th. Locations to be determined. But I'm hearing trails in general are in pretty good shape, so we could probably go just about anywhere in June, I would imagine. And then we have a big trip, day trip planned uh, to the Museum of Idaho on Wednesday, June 29th. You should have all gotten an email invitation a couple days ago from me 
just send me an email to RSVP because the space is a little bit limited because of the van and we need to make reservations for lunch as well. So we're going to depart from the museum, from the, you know, the staff volunteer parking in the south lot um, at 8.30 in the morning and um, have lunch at Snow Eagle Brewery and leave there about 2 p.m. to head back to Jackson. And we can pick up from either here at the museum or at the Stilson lot, depending on what's convenient for you. Some volunteer opportunities coming up. Um, Fables, Feathers, and Fur. We have an opening coming up on June 3rd, so I'd love to have somebody, um, if that date works for you, let me know, um, or sign up on VicNet. July and August are pretty much open, and we will have help from our education intern, um, but it would be good to have some of you help with that. I know some of you summer folks have already told me that you're interested in helping in July and August, so feel free to let me know if a date works for you, um, or sign up on VicNet. As part of the Above the Clouds Wapiti exhibit for the summer, we're going to be building what we're calling the Community Cliff. Um, if you remember last year for the spiders exhibit, we had little paper spiders that people could make and then hang on the webs. Similar kind of idea where Jane and I are going to build out of foam core, well not foam core, but like insulation foam. We're going to build a cliff that's going to be thin, but kind of layered, it's hard to describe, um, that's going to go along the whole back wall in the Wapiti and it'll be painted, and then we're going to have a paper flower making um, station set up in the center of that room so people can um, make their own flower and then put it into the, the cliff. Um, so that's going to be really fun. And Julia's going to be working with a couple of um, different classes of students, and so we'll have several flowers kind of started from kids, and then people can add to it, kind of similar to what we did last year. Um, so we may need some help. If that sounds like a fun sort of crafty thing for you, I have like a hot knife and then we'll be painting. We'll be cutting this foam and then painting it um, and then installing it. So if anyone's interested in helping with that, um, you're welcome to. June 6th and 7th is what I have scheduled as a, a cliff building from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. And then we'll be installing on June 13th and 14th. So if that sounds like fun, let me know. As Stephanie mentioned, the community event for the Bunner opening the evening of June 3rd. I do still need some, some greeter clickers or people to hand out tokens, like she said. Um, and also one more person to be sort of stationed in the galleries as a kind of a tour guide, but not necessarily like a docent, just someone to be stationed next to a piece of art and talk about that piece or, or the artist a little bit in a fun way for like two minutes and then kind of go through that spiel several times for people as they move through. Um, it should be really fun. Um, but I'm looking for one more person to help out with that. And then Plein Air Fest thing went around, so that's great. Um, we have a Rungus Roundup on the calendar for June 30th from 5 to 7. And I believe those positions are on VicNet too. I can't remember off the top of my head now what those opportunities were. Might be a similar thing actually to the, I think we were also going to station people in the galleries to, to chat about the, um, the women um, exhibit Butter and Beyond. And then two other things, um, Visitor's Choice Voting Facilitator, and you'll find this job description in that um, volunteer manual too. But um, let's see, where is it? I think I printed it off. Here we go. So this is with Marketing Department. Um, so basically in, in celebration of the 35th anniversary, we're sort of hosting an event or a happening every month um, through April of next year. And so July's happening is Visitor's Choice Voting. And so all museum visitors will have the opportunity to basically vote on their favorite piece in the museum. And so they're probably going to be all over the place. It could be really interesting. Um, so every guest is, um, can, they can vote once. We'll provide the paper and the pencils. Um, but we'll need some volunteer sort of facilitators just to be around to um, explain that process, encourage them to vote, and I think we'll have a table set up in Sullivan Hall for someone to, to do that job. So, and that will be, you know, whenever you like during museum hours, all through the month of July. And then uh, Julia, too, is looking for just some more volunteers to help with education. Um, to help with youth groups, um, youth education, school tours, things like that. So anyone with an education background or really anybody who just likes working with kids, 
Um, if you want to be more involved with Julia and helping her with school groups, just let us know too, because we tend to get pretty busy in the summer, and it'd be great to have just, you know, a handful of volunteers in our back pocket that we can grab once those um, school tours come up. Um, and if you're interested, then we can kind of get everybody trained um, on that. So if you want to learn, learn that. Um, it'd be great to have a few people. Um, yes. One question about the uh, sure. tables, feathers, and fur. Yeah. Do you typically have only one volunteer doing your reading? Do you ever have two or more? I leave it pretty, time? I leave it open. It, it's um, available really to go either way. If somebody wants to come in and just read the story, that's fine. If somebody wants to help with the story and the art making, that's great too. If somebody wants to take over the whole darn thing, that's great too. If you want to choose the book and <laughs> choose the art project, like, that's fine. It's not a hard thing to do, um, and it's pretty fun. So if you've, if you have a grandchild or something that has a book that they love, um, that somehow relates to wildlife or nature or our collection in some way, um, a painting that we have out, um, just let us let us know, and we can design something around that. Uh, but the reason I'm asking is because um, I don't have any personal experience, but mm -hmm. apparently having children is difficult. So people, people, people are showing up. It's rewarding and wonderful. <laughs> and you should do it. But it's a 30 minute program, and people are showing up, you know, 15 minutes late, and their kids are screaming oh, and sure. stuff like that. So yeah. it, I just get a little traffic jam at the you know, desk. And oh, yeah. I mean, I can, just depending on staffing, I can try to, you know, have one person designating to, like, leave people, you know, through the galleries. But right. I try my best to kind of, you know, scoot everybody to get there in on time. And Fable, the tricky thing about, one of the tricky things about Fables is that we have no idea how many kids will show up. Um, we ask large groups if a homeschool group wants to come in, you know, they need to call us ahead of time. But some days, you know, it's raining and there's nothing going on. And what was it? One day last year, two years ago, we had 70 kids. We were like, oh, okay, this is great success. But holy cow, we're scrambling for supplies. Um, that's exceptionally rare. You know, it's, it's more common to have one kid where you're like, oh, is this worth it? I don't know. Um, so it's, it's all over the board and that's kind of tricky. Yeah, but whatever we can do to, you know, to help the front desk, if it's helpful to have a staff up there helping direct traffic or a volunteer up there helping direct traffic, I try to keep an eye if I see that there's a huge group and kind of float through the galleries and direct people. But usually the footprints, you know, work pretty well once they're in that space, but, right. yeah. So, what do you, so, the people coming in, they just need to get a tag and then get the no-drink food water speed? Yeah, I mean, every, everybody, you know, we, we encourage to check in at the front desk, and, and it's, especially when you have young children in strollers, almost everybody has a beverage container, and, um, you know, somewhere, so I have to kind of visually inspect everything, so it takes time if there's just a, a line of, you know, group, couple groups in the front who are just normal customers going through the galleries, and they're stuck in the back of the line, and, you know, it just, it gets a little tricky, because they're, they're, they're in a rush, and they're trying to get to the program on time, and they're waiting in line five, five minutes or so. Mm -hmm. So it's something I can certainly try to work out at the front desk too, but if we have a surplus of people signed up on any given day, if anybody right. would want to come out at like 10, 20 or 10, 15 or so, that could right. that'd probably help. I was gonna say, I generally ask a volunteer for Fables to show up by you know, 10, 15, 10, 20, mm -hmm. just to, to make sure. And if, it, if it's helpful to have that volunteer come in at 10, 15 and just go to the, you know, start at the front desk and start by directing traffic, I mean, Julia and I and the intern, like with all that much help, we can have everything, you know, we can have the prints down and the book set up and generally we'll talk to the volunteer before the day of about the book, you know, and what the project is and that kind of thing. If they're already aware of that, then they could yeah. probably help and then and then just start reading at 10.30. I don't yeah. want to drag this out too long, but, but anyways, um, if, if there's a long line and you see some strollers yeah. in the back of the line, you know, kind of pluck them out and say, hey, are you here for story time? Follow right. me, because there's no polite way for me to you know, address somebody in the back of the line when I have somebody right, right. right in front of me. Yeah, that's good. Question, Vivian? Do you start doing it like half an hour before the museum opens? So that you get the kids, I mean, kids are often on an earlier schedule anyway. <laughs> that's true. I mean, if, and then you can mm -hmm. get some of that bottleneck out the door yeah. before you address them, and then they're out the door with the other, I mean, I, I have no idea if that's a staff yeah. thing. Yeah, well, now that we're opening, opening at 10 a.m., that's not really a staff thing. Well, now that we're opening at 10 a.m., I mean, I could almost see it starting at 9.30. At 9.30, if right. you start it at 9.30, Right. Because you are opening the museum early for people, mm -hmm. you have a better management of 
staffing and supplies mm -hmm. and all of that. Just a thought. Yeah, that's something to something to consider for sure. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Um, the only last thing here on this section was just a, a list of exhibits that we have right now just for everybody to be aware of. State of the art student art show. You've got a couple more days. If you haven't seen it this year, you need to go see it. So some of you summer people that are just getting here, go take it, take a look at it because it's really great. Um, and then Scenes of Transcendent Beauty, Thomas Moran's Yellowstone opened May 14th and it's up until August 23rd. Does that sound right? Yeah. 23rd? Um, Bonaire and Beyond opens officially June 4th through August 16th, and then Above the Clouds opens June 25th. I have November 13th on here, but I believe that changed. It's open, It's closing a little bit earlier um, in October. So that's all for my agenda stuff there. I am going to turn it over to Adam. Um, hello, everyone. Hi, Hi. I was trying to think, it might have been a year since I've been I think it was. to talk to you all. Um, we can make it more or less often, uh, whatever you all want. Um, so I, I threw together uh, some random things that I've been uh, working on with the Carl Rungus catalog raisin A. Um, there's a really nice uh, write up in Call of the Wild that. Dina and Chev helped with. Um, so that can give a, a good amount of background on the project. We're into, we just started year two of this. Um, and the first uh, couple years we really concentrated on um, visiting museum collections, doing whatever research we could online, um, and building sort of a foundation from which to grow. So in the museum's database here, we have our own little section of it, and we've got over a thousand records right now of Rungus uh, things, images to do further research on. Most, well, many of them, um, we might have a black and white photo from 1950 and the title that someone made up and then nothing else. So there's a lot of work to be done but we feel really good um, about where we are. Um, and I say we because I have a great assistant who's helping me out in, um, who lives in California. And she previously, well, actually still does, worked with Peter Hasrick over in uh, Cody on the Remington Raisonne. And she's also the director of the Albert Bierstadt Raisonne. So she knows way more about this stuff than I do <laughs> and uh, has been a big help. So, I, so just to give you a sort of sense of what I've been up to and some of the fun things I've been seeing, um, we got to start traveling a little bit last fall. Um, I took, I think, three trips or four trips. Uh, the first one, I got to go to Oklahoma and Texas. You can see uh, board member Sue Simpson Gallagher there helping me out. Um, in Oklahoma at the National Cowboy and Western Heritage Museum, which I think many of you have been to. They have a really nice uh, moose painting. Um, and that's their curator, Michael Grauer, on the right. Uh, it's always, you know, sometimes more fun to have people in your photos, because I end up with a lot of just photos and paintings. But that's, what this, <laughs> that's what this whole thing's about, right? Um, went to, got to see a private collection in Texas. Um, and you might recognize the, maybe the story or the theme of that uh, black and white one over there, um, which is very close to our own stampede painting that's out in that JKM gallery. Um, also, I think it's funny is, I think he might have had a, a taxidermy mount of, a, um, of an elk uh, in his studio, or he did a lot of studies, because uh, this, this cow shows up pretty often. It looks, especially that one over there. It looks to me like it's sort of a wall mount that he inserted into the painting. These are both kind of early, and as you know, early on, he was really still trying to figure out what he wanted to do with his life. And then, or his painting. Um, and then this pose, uh, we found like five or six examples so far of uh, the elk kind of bugling out uh, valley. Um, so is that Madashine actually in oil also? Yep, mm -hmm. it is. 
Um, and so that's another interesting thing is there's, uh, we're finding all these uh, references to his work and reproductions of his work in books and magazines. I have about 232 bibliographic references right now. But sometimes it's hard to know whether it was in wash or pencil or whatever versus oil. Later on, I think there were more oils. Earlier on, I think for the illustrations, he used something a little bit faster. Uh, it, there are quite a few Rungus paintings in individual little museums across New England, which I probably had never realized before. So if we did a little, Christine, my wife got to come on this one, did a little tour of Vermont, uh, New Hampshire, and Massachusetts. Um, which one did I spell wrong? Massachusetts. God, I spelled, I was born in Massachusetts and I spell it wrong <laughs> every time. Because I wish I was born in Wyoming. I think you, you've all heard that story before. Um, so... It's okay, you're pretty. If you, um, we won't talk. Thank you. Uh, it's because it's just abbreviated, Emmy. Less and less so every day. Um, who, who has been to the Shelburne? pretty great. So if you have a chance to go, when they're open, they were not open when I went. Um, Is it close to the Ben and Jerry's factory? It's the only place I've been in Vermont. No, it's in Shelburne, Vermont. It's across from upstate New York. My whole geography of the East is awful. But anyway, it's a beautiful museum. They have all these historic houses, and then they have this great Rungus collection. They opened up for me. They brought out the Rungus paintings and laid them out on the floor, as you can see, so I could see them all. This is one of the most fun things about this project, is that museums in particular are, you know, super excited and willing to help me out. Um, you can see, again, this, again, that pose of that elk. So it's just something that he painted quite often. Um, probably something that his clients were interested in buying. So, that was in Shelburne, we went down to... What's the, what's the waterfall? So the, the waterfall things above there? are not rungus. Okay, I was going to say. The things <laughs> below <different>. are rungus. <laughs> Got it. So these, they just leave up. These, um, they take out of a not climate controlled building, store them for the winter, and then put them back in, I think. Because there's, there's maybe 20 buildings on this huge campus that they have. It's fascinating. Um, early, this is a deadlocked uh, caribou uh, painting, and then the kind of classic moose. Uh, I call this the grouchy bighorn. Um, when you are looking at a small image of it, or you're a little bit far away, it really looks like he's very cross. But you get up close, and it looks you know totally normal. It's just part of an interesting visual effect. This is at Williams, uh, in Williamstown, Massachusetts. That was a really fun uh, New england -y visit. Went to the Hood Museum at Dartmouth, where they have two paintings. Um, the, one, the moose, this is an early moose right here. Then they have a way off-site storage. They brought it in for me to look at, which was really nice. And then this classic Western scene that um, Runga started doing these scenes in the 1915 to 1920 kind of era when he was broadening what he was doing. He came back to Wyoming during that period in the summers. Um, and these, these, plus his landscapes, as you know, uh, really helped uh, gain him a, more of a national reputation than he had before. If you're ever in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, which is right by the Berkshires, this is a great museum, the Berkshire Museum, um, founded by the family who, this is a great story, so I'm gonna screw it up, uh, Crane Paper Company, who produced the paper that uh, the US Treasury printed all of the money on from like the beginning until now. So they are literally making the paper on which the treasury prints money. So they're printing money, basically. So very wealthy family. They decided in the Berkshires they wanted to have a museum to not rival, but a museum to approximate like the Met. So uh, Mr. Uh, Crane sent people out all over the world to collect different things. They have mummies. They have, right now, an aquarium in the basement, they have taxidermy, and they have one great Rungus painting. 
<laughs> so that was a really fun visit. They were, again, super nice, uh, super friendly, and that really is a beautiful bighorn uh, painting. From a little bit later in his career, probably in uh, Canada, but just, yeah, phenomenal, and such a surprise in a really interesting, odd museum. So if you're ever in Pittsfield, go, go visit them. Um, Calgary and Banff, of course, as many of you know, the Glenbow Museum has the uh, largest collection of Rungus materials, uh, second, no, or second only to them. Uh, the Glenbow is closed for renovations for like three years. Um, so Sue came on that trip too. We were lucky to get in and go through their racks. Um, they're closed right now, all the, they're redoing the entire building from the inside out. Um, and I think they'll be back open in 23 or 24. Um, unfortunately for me, they have the best run this archive, so I have to wait until they reopen to go back up there and do all the kind of research I need to do. Um, but they have a great collection of his landscape studies, as you can see on that slide over there. Um, and they have uh, quite a few of the New York Zoological Society paintings as well, um, similar to our three that are in the... Sullivan Hall, um, and their polar bear is phenomenal, like it's just amazing, nice amazing colors. painting. Yeah, the colors are unbelievable. And it, we, this was just in storage, like on a, on a cart, and it, Sue and I were like, wow, that's just unbelievable. Um, the White Museum in Banff also has a few really great pieces. Um, this is a landscape that he was doing again when he started doing the Western pieces. Um, he won a big prize for this. It gained him a lot of recognition. Uh, it's a really important piece that, um, actually, I think we borrowed this quite a few years ago when we did the Yellowstone Deep Pond uh, exhibit. Anyway, so there's, well, one more, one more travel part. I went to Denver. Um, the Anschutz Collection is in, called, sort of, their title of their museum is, I think, the American Museum of Western Art. It is in the the pool building that's across from the Brown Palace Hotel. If any of you are familiar with Denver, it's called the Navarro Building. Um, great historic building and a really wonderful collection that they have there. Two runguses. This one they brought out for me, so it's sitting on the floor. And then this one is another uh, cattle scene that he did probably in 1920 or thereabouts. Yeah, they're really beautiful. Um, and it's such an honor to get to see them in person. So in addition to me just going around and looking at paintings and, and f familiarizing myself a little bit better with, with all of his work, um, I'm trying to figure out a way to better date his work, because as some of you know, he didn't date his work very often, and it's kind of hard to track things down. So one idea I had um, is to collect signatures as I go. So I take a close-up of a signature for every painting I see, and then on the ones I know the dates for, I can make sort of a grid and see what sort of things I can figure out. Uh, thus far, that hasn't been terribly successful, but I'll show you some examples. This top one is from the museum's collection with the stone sheep that are out there. And you can see he wrote, or someone wrote, 1948 underneath it. So that you can say, okay, we'll take that, it's 1948. Um, skip down to 1933. It's not really too much of a difference that I can tell. And he was very random about the dots that he put in. So sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not. Maybe sometimes he tried to do it, but it didn't show up very well. So I thought maybe, oh, after this point, he put a dot after the S. Nope, that's not, <laughs> not a helpful clue. Uh, now moving down to like 1927, 1921, still kind of similar. There's not really a lot of differences there. Uh, see here, like maybe he put a dot there, but it didn't show up. Anyway, that is not, not a clue at all. It's not, sometimes it's thicker, sometimes it's thinner. So, anyway, um, it's good to have all these things, but they didn't do quite what I wanted them to do. 21 and 12, still kind of similar, pretty consistent. Um, Finally, we get down to 1906 and 1905, 
and you can see this is the one change that I've been able to find. So it looks like about 1906 he started making this slash down like this, but before that he did this nice curve. So, and I've backed this up with, with uh, more examples. So the one thing that we can say is that pre-1905, or right around the middle of 1905, he changed his uh, signature. And so before that, you'll see more of the curvy one. And after that, you'll see more of the slash one. So it's easier now to say, oh no, that's a, that is a really early one. That's before 1905. And I know that because we've got this cool evidence. Here's one from 1900. What about the R? Are there any changes in the R? I don't know. That would be something. I feel like... Um, it has more of a tail earlier. It looks yeah. like it's a little straighter. And so there's the yeah, little curve. I don't know. It's just so random. And it's not random. But the, the differences are a little random. So yeah. to mm -hmm. look for something that is a, a conscious change on his part, right. the only thing <laughs> I've found is that this one, and which is helpful, but I was hoping like in the midstream, you know, maybe he added something, but whatever. Say lovey. Uh, but that's been, that's been another fun part of this that I've been working can you, on. Can you tell by style or anything? I mean, yes, so then the next thing is definitely style. And as we know, there's a trajectory of uh, how he developed as an artist um, with later works using less paint in the background, mid period really thick, lots of great brushwork and impasto, and early works being tighter. But that only is like decades, you know, <laughs> separates things for me in that realm. But anyway, so I'm working on that. Um, and hopefully by the end of this project, I'll have a better sense of how to precisely date things. Um, also, I, th I hope most of you know this story that there's two different versions of the sheep. One skinny version was the first version he made. This is out there, but the, they're usually turned around. Um, he gave this sheep to his guide, Jimmy Simpson, and his guide said, Rungus, that looks like one of those sheep that you strung up in camp. It has no muscle tone, it has no vigor, no life. So Rungus took that to heart, added some material to his, to his model, and then cast a few more with this bulkier aspect. So when I go out and I'm looking at these sheep, I need to have a quick way to say, oh, that's a later one or that's an earlier one, because I think he did a certain number of each, maybe five of each. So Emily and Lizzie helped me with this. I bought these wooden calipers so I could do these strange measurements. And it turns out he definitely built up the back end. Um, and then what I didn't quite realize is that he added to the rib cage. And so it seems to me so far, I've measured one other one in the Bible collection, that the girth around the ribs is really the easiest way to tell if it's a recent one, or if it's the second version of the first one. So time will tell on that. We're doing okay on time, right, yeah. ourselves? Mm -hmm. So that's just a few of like the components of this. And then a big, big part of it that we're working on is an exhibit for next summer called Survival of the Fittest. Um, and we're going to borrow about 20 or 22 paintings from a museum in Enskede in the Netherlands. Um, bring them over here, match them up with our paintings, and do a big exhibit of the big four, which I think most of you know is, oh, there's my cool map. <laughs> travel. It's going to cost way more than $2,400 to bring all those over. Um, so big four, we're going to have Richard Frieza, Kuhnert, Lilifors, Rungus. To both, because this is a great show to do, but also as a way to get the word out there about this project. This was so part marketing, but also part project that I really wanted to do. Um, and one of the focuses will be on where did these artists paint? And in terms of those landscapes, how are they doing today? And in many uh, cases, these places have become amazing national parks, 
wildlife preserves, etc. So that'll be a big part of the interpretation of this. Um, so we'll have maps and other things. Um, and another focus is they were able to do this because they were able to actually go to these places in person. So they were in, you know, well, Kuhner was in Africa. Uh, Frieza saw red deer in whatever sort of natural state they were in at that point. Lillifors had an island that he lived on that all this amazing bird life flew by every day. And then, you know, Rungus came here, went to Canada, went to the Yukon, etc. So this is next summer? Next summer. Uh, same, you know, May through August, basic sort of thing. It'll be in Bison Changing Vision and the Artist Theater, because I, I couldn't cut down my list. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one interesting thing will be there, you know, of course they didn't see all of these animals in the wild, so especially Frieza used his imagination and painted uh, lions and tigers based on studies he made in the zoo. Um, what he did see in the wild were moose. Uh, this is a phenomenal battle in moose painting from the Rijksmuseum in Enschede. Got our polar bear and our awesome uh, red deer painting from Kaiser Wilhelm's hunting grounds. There are uh, fewer Frieza paintings out there than of the other guys, so we have to supplement uh, our section on Frieza with one or two paintings from private collections. I really wanted to just keep it masterworks from here and the museum in Enschede, but we had to fill in a little bit. It's a cool piece, though. Yeah, it's really nice. Really nice. Uh, this one hasn't been out in a while, but this is a great uh, moose uh, painting from the collection here. And right. Yep. Why aren't there as many Frieza? I mean, he died. Before. He um. I don't know, other than maybe many of them uh, were destroyed in World War II or World War I. Uh, that's certain. Yeah, certain ha certainly happened to a bunch of Kuhner paintings. Kuhner, I think, had more, better distribution, if you will. Like, things got out a little bit more. Frieza, at that point, was, I think, kind of an even more of a niche artist than wildlife artist today. Like, I think he had some certain specific collectors, like Kaiser Wilhelm, few others, so if those collections got damaged or destroyed, then that was it. Um, he did get to go, uh, Frieza, on an expedition up to Svalbard, which is uh, an island uh, above Norway, right? Um, and we actually have a really nice uh, little research paper about where exactly he was. Um, I think in our polar bear painting. Somebody identified that building for me. Um, so that'll be part of the interpretation. Uh, polar bears, moose, you know. You're, you know, classic Northern European uh, subjects. Uh, we're gonna move on to Kunert. Um, and one of the fun things will be is you can really tell how Kunert was influenced by Frieza. We'll be able to really talk about that. This. Uh, Vizent painting is obviously highly influenced by the moose painting that we saw earlier. These are the European bison that live in a, now live only in a one forest in uh, Poland, Ilia Wysa, which is a really hard word to say. Um, but still, it's a place where these bison have lived for their whole lives. They, I think it like got down to 25 examples in the wild or in captivity and they've managed to bring them back, so it's kind of parallel to our own bison story, so that kind of thing will be in here. Um, of course, our classic lion painting, elephant, the Breaks Museum has this great giraffe, great lion, it's more impressionistic Kunert, you can't tell from these crappy photos, but um, that's a really nice one. Cape Buffalo, Zebra from here. And then this one, uh, this composition or this subject may seem a little familiar to you. Mm. There's a really great Bob Coon painting out in Pathways 
uh, where he clearly was looking at this painting when he was coming up with uh, the idea for that one. And I love them both, uh, um, but it'll be fun to see those kind of proximity to each other. Uh, we have one other kind of interesting fact, Kunert may not have ever gone to India. We know that he went to Sri Lanka. So he definitely saw this guy, an Indian elephant, but he may not have ever seen a tiger in the wild. And yet he painted a phenomenal tiger painting. So that'll be something fun to investigate and talk about. And then uh, Lilifor, some beautiful, uh, mostly bird paintings. This painting I'm hoping we can get, it's as big as like that wall over there. So hopefully we can figure out the logistics of getting it across the ocean. Is there a bird in there? There is. This owl right here it is a phenomenal painting. It's cool. And we just hope we can get it here. If not, maybe we'll do a big, like, you know, wall-sized decal or something. Never as good as the real thing, but. Um, this was a really famous painting during his lifetime. Artists like George McLean, uh, he has this painting like packed up on his wall. So anyways, there'll be a nice uh, opportunity to see works by these artists that you all haven't necessarily seen before. It's classics from here. Nice wolf. Some more birds. Great, uh, snowy, uh, snowshoe hair from the like, sleeping. All right, and then on to Rungus, and so you'll see this one more from our collection, fewer from uh, Enskidi, uh, and trying again to both show how great a painter uh, Rung Rungus was, but also the different places that he went. So this one, the early lost timber from New Brunswick, then Canada paintings, caribou that's in the uh, Enskidi collection. This is their goat painting. Our elk painting. They're on some snowy painting. This is another. This is an elk painting from Enskidi, but we have one where he sort of started it off but reversed it. So we have one that looks the same but that's in a different orientation. This uh, beautiful. He's from here, my favorite mountain goat painting. And then we're going to try to, we're going to put the triptych back together, which will be uh, fun. So, that'll be awesome. And we are working on a tour for this exhibit after it shows here. Uh, this is all like still details that we're working on, but it should go to the National Sporting Library and Museum in Virginia go down to the James Museum of Western and Wildlife Art in St. Petersburg, Florida, come over to the Briscoe Museum of Western uh -huh. Art in San Antonio, go up to Lee Aki Woodson in Wausau, Wisconsin, and then come down and end at the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art in Kansas City, which is a, maybe one of the biggest metropolitan museums that we've ever seen. So, uh, how many pieces have? So it's, 40 something, because it's, uh, and there a lot of them are huge. So it, it, I started off like it's going to be 10 by each artist, and I was trying to be really rigid about it. But then, since you know, there wasn't as many freezes, and I just I decided let's just pick the best of what we can get, and it ended up being sort of between 8 and 10 from each person. Maybe, yeah, 12 from Rungus, I don't know. So I had to break down the own you know, my own rules that I had set up in my head, and I think it ended up being a better uh, project for that. So that, I mean, that's uh, kind of a cross-section of what I've been working on. We also have started taking submissions from private collectors. We've had about seven or eight so far. We've had the first one that we had to say no. I don't think we're going to put that in our catalog resume, because it is this painting. Um, so um, if you're out and about and if you you know you're talking to someone and they say, oh my you know, my cousin has a rungus painting, then if they would like to, they can just email me at cr at wildlifeart.org and we'll start this process 
of uh, evaluating their papers. So, um, what else? Any other questions? They can call me too, but it's so much easier. Okay, I just didn't know that's because it's easier for yep. me. Then. And on the website, we have a whole page. It's got all the info on there. My okay. phone number's on there. My email address is on there. So, the website is great. This is really easy to remember. Uh, that's the project email address. Um, yeah. Questions? It's really fun. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, engaging, something new crops up, you know, almost every day or every week. Some new thing to investigate. And so, and I think in the end, it's going to be this, you know, project, hopefully, of real lasting value. So, mm -hmm. I'm happy to have the opportunity to do it. Thank you. Bobby, thanks, Adam. Thank oh, you. yeah. When Murphy was, was in Canada, did he ever come back to the U.S. after Canada? Yes. And I think more often than we have previously thought. Okay. But he only went back to Germany once? I think he only yeah. went back to Germany once. Um, early day, in the, the early part, he came over here, maybe went out a couple times, to, came out to Wyoming at least once, went back to Germany, showed off all his stuff. I think he left uh, all of the collection of stuff that he had gathered in Germany, like the horns and the hides and all sorts of things. Um, came back here, and then I'm pretty sure he didn't go back. But yeah, the part of this too will be to develop a much more detailed and reliable timeline of this summer, he went to New Brunswick, Wyoming, and then he went to Canada. This summer, he did this, this, and this, which I don't think we quite have nailed down uh, at this juncture. So, anyway. Great. Yeah. Nice to see you all. Hey, Adam, can I ask a question? Uh -huh. I love, I love Stampede. Yep. In the JKM gallery, mm -hmm. that feels a lot tighter to me than some of these pieces that are more with like cubism in the bottom and that yep. kind of thing. Was that just a different? So that was his earlier style, when he was just out of school, and it took him a while to develop into the more impressionistic mm -hmm. uh, work of okay. his later so years. I said, I said it backwards. No, so the so tighter is earlier, looser is later. later. Okay. Um, in part because he was in New York City, and there were a bunch of other uh, artists there who were painting more impressionistically. He took some lessons, or at least was mentored by someone who was a big proponent of Impressionism. And it, so these are later, because this is so much looser. Um, and then, if just like uh, as a guess, this seems like thicker paint in the background. If he spent more time working on this, this uh, you could say might be a little bit thinner. And so this would be later, and that would be earlier. I could be totally wrong on that. That's the part I'm still trying to, to figure out. This could be, you know, 1930 and 19, yeah, so this one says 1940, that says 23. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I would bet money that this is later than that. But we've got to figure out a way to, to do it more precisely than just me guessing. It was experience. fun, and yeah. for, after having not been able to travel for a year and a half or whatever we all went through, it was really nice to get back out. We went to some nice places. Yep, for sure. Mm -hmm. Good for you. Yeah. All right. Cool. So where do we find on the website about Okay, so go this? to collection and then go, there it is. Mm -hmm. Cool. There's all the Was, I think, yeah, he did, and over the course of his life, he definitely had a photographer come in and take some professional studio mm -hmm. portraits. Mm -hmm. um, so was he from wealth, Adam? Do you have a like, They're not, yeah, not a huge amount of wealth, but enough that he could go, come over here to the States and not have to get a job immediately, you know, he had enough money to support him, um, but he, he he definitely had to do something 
with his life. He couldn't have just, I think, coasted with his whole career. His uncle that he came to visit was a doctor. Yeah. Um, pretty well established in Brooklyn. Um, so, yeah, they had a little bit of fun. Cool. All right. I'm going to take off. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. I pulled up the website here just um, for a couple minutes of training. I thought it would be a good idea just because our website is new and I know how hard it is to get used to a new website. So just for a couple minutes here, what do you guys look for on the website? What do you want to help find? Lori. I'm always looking for the staff's last name. Yeah, spell it so I can send them an email. Okay. So. so anytime you click on this logo, you're going to go home. So that's the home page. Um, staff information, I believe, is under about. Let's see if I'm right. And then about the museum. And then I think if we scroll down. One of the tricky things for me about this website is try scrolling down. Um, Our staff. So our staff right there, there's a list of board members, yeah. and then there's the staff directory. Although we have a few new people that are not on here yet, so we need to get them added. Um, but this looks really pretty, so I will at least say that. And then obviously you can click on, click on here too, I think, and it will automatically. My computer probably isn't set up though to have email that way, but... Anyway, okay, so that's that. So you see what I mean about scrolling down. Like sometimes it's hard to find these labels or whatever, but you can just kind of scroll down to get, eventually get there too. But <coughs> it wasn't intuitive to me. Right. It takes a little practice. Um, so what else? What else should I look for to show you people? So they don't have much information about the artists yet. Um, I believe, well, let's go, normally you would click on collection and then this explore the collection. This is a really wonderful feature, um, but I think it says we're still hibernating. Let me see. Yep. We're in hibernation, so this part's not finished yet. But once that's, once that's back up, yeah, yeah, that's a really fabulous place to go. Um, to quickly look at, especially at, like as a docent, if you're giving a tour and you want to know if a particular piece is on view, theoretically, in an ideal world, that would tell you whether or not it's on view. So that is um, coming soon, although I haven't heard a date yet for when, when they'll be out of hibernation. But so there's that. What else? Hours should be pretty easy to find. Um, I mean, obviously, this has right there. Visit has, I think plan your visit is going to list um, admissions, information about groups, there's your pricing, <coughs> groups and private tours. Um, What's under learn? <coughs> learn. There's a link to Bisoncast videos. And then here's information on fables under the pre-K. Yeah. Fables, feathers, and fur, scheduling, Julia's email, K through 12, <coughs> probably, I think this is where we find the scholarship. Yep, here's Bisoncast again. And then high school scholarship information there. Uh, what's on is exhibits. What's hard for me to get used to is you. if you want to know about future ex exhibitions, our old website had currently at NIMWA and upcoming exhibits. That's kind of a separate thing. Now you just click on currently at NIMWA and then scroll down for upcoming stuff. Let's see, here's the current exhibits. So you can scroll down and here's what's current. If you just keep going down or click up here on upcoming events, then it will take you to, oh, see that took me to events, and then long-term exhibits. 
So my, my advice with this website is just keep scrolling down. <laughs> um, so here's information on Bernard and Beyond, for example. Um, the other big thing that I'll point out is the volunteer page. So under support, and then here's information um, if someone want, is interested in becoming a volunteer. You can, you can click here, I think, and get to resources for current volunteers. So that will take you to this page. Or the more straightforward way is to go support for volunteers right there. That's like for current volunteers. So this tells you, um, you know, there's a click here to log into VicNet. Here's where you'd enter your password, which is still 18 lowercase v o l uppercase n m w a submit, and then that's your list of you know these these things up here, um, training resources, training schedules, the volunteer manual, which I now need to update. Um, connect. Mm -hmm. Okay, so oh, there's a link to our Facebook group, a list of docents, um, the volunteer directory, which again, I need to update. Here's your like required readings for docents, so most of the things that are in that manual that are listed as well can be found right here. They can also be found in the library. Volunteer of the Year list, Wyoming Sage Society list, how to contact me, museum directory for all employees. So there's another place where you can go to find the staff directory. Anything else people want me to show on here? What was that password that you used? It didn't send from there. Oh, it's 18 and then lowercase v o l, uppercase n m w a. I can write that down on your sheet for you if you want. The only reason that page is password protected is because the directory is stored on there with people's phone numbers. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. is that good for for that? Anything else I should show you? Okay. I'm gonna get out of here. The next thing I wanted to talk about for a little sort of training today is what we're calling the artist benches. And they are currently out in the um, Moran watercolor exhibit. So, and you should all check that out today while you're here too, if you haven't um, seen the exhibit. But there are two wooden benches, pretty simple, basic benches, and we can rearrange them. We can separate them and turn them in different ways. Um, and each one is installed with an iPad via a little snake arm holder. Um, and so they're installed in there permanently. And then there's a, a stylus, an Apple Pencil stylus that's attached to the iPad. And they are installed with this um, painting program called Infinite Painter. And I don't have enough iPads to like distribute them today to let you play with it. But if you get a chance, go out there and play with it. Um, I would love for volunteers to be able to at least a little bit help someone if they're struggling with this program. If you happen to be in the galleries or walking through and you see that somebody's like frustrated with it or it's not working for some reason, I know that's maybe that's a lot to ask, um, but I thought I could at least kind of give you a basic rundown of this because this is something that we're going to, or at least we plan to, move into other exhibits. So when the Moran exhibit leaves, this is something that we could move into like the Rungus Gallery, for example. Um, the idea is that we can't have people in the gallery with water or with paints. They're allowed um, an actual pencil and a piece of paper, but um, it would be really nice to be able to actually paint in the galleries to be inspired by what you're looking at. Um, so this Infinite Painter program has lots of different, what they call brushes. So we have it set up in the current exhibit. Um, the instructions are on the table here, but we, um, in the instructions it tells you like which which brush to try first and the idea is to, to play with like a watercolor style but we could move it into the rungus gallery and suggest like some of the oil brushes so it really has a different um, 
feel. All the brushes are different, and it's very realistic, this program. It's really cool. Um, when I first downloaded it and started playing with it, it did manage to convince me that I wasn't actually painting, which was really cool, because I had, I had the iPad, and I had my stylus, and I was trying to keep my hand off the iPad because I didn't want to smear the paint. Um, and I actually took the, the stylus and wiped it on my pants too, like to clean my brush. And I was like, wow, this really has me, has me convinced. Um, so in the, um, I was on the jury for the upcoming yeah. thing. There were a couple things that said digital painting. Is that how they were done? Oh yeah, totally. So there's a lot of different programs. Infinite Painter is one of many. Um, I chose this one because I liked the variety of brushes as far as the watercolor specific. Um, but there's the really big one that's really popular is called Procreate. Kind of a strange name, but Procreate um, is a really good one, but it's, it didn't seem as user friendly for the average Joe that comes in. I wanted something pretty simple. All these programs are really powerful and they can do a lot. Um, the user manual for Infinite Painter is like 600 pages. And so when I sat down like, okay, how am I gonna teach some random person coming in the gallery how to use this? So these instructions are pretty simplified. I was hoping to get it onto like two pages and I think we ended up, Carrie helped me design this. Um, so we got it down to like, you know, double-sided three pages. But, um, so the first page is like, if you want more detailed instructions, which, you know, you could help direct someone to this too. Like, I don't understand these directions or well, how do I do something that's not listed here? You can, um, well, I'll show you how to do that. So out in the galleries, it, the iPads should be on this screen or they might be on somebody's project already if somebody doesn't close it out. So the first um, sort of step here is to, this is the home, this little house thing in the center kind of small on the screen. Maybe I should dim the lights. So ideally, it'll be on this screen when the guest sits down to use it. And there are two different ways to start. You can start with a blank project, or you can start from an image. So I thought that it would be cool for the guest who maybe isn't an artist or is intimidated by a blank screen um, to start with some Moran like black and white images that more like a coloring book, right? So if you click this from image and then photos on the iPad the only option you'll have are these four These are you know since this is my computer There's a lot of other photos and images, but out there you'll have these four images to choose from so you can and it's a touch screen, right? So you'll be touching it Touch that and then click touch create and then it does this. So now you have something to like work on, work from. Um, we've tried to position the benches so that you can sit there and, and look at these four pieces pretty easily, although you might have to kind of get up for a couple of them and walk a few steps, but um, to kind of get the, the coloring and see what things are. So, but if someone wants more information, let's see, remind myself here to, figure out more complicating things. Okay, so there's, oops, there's three little dots in the corner here, that's your menu. You can touch that, and then there's something here at the bottom called Classroom, which is really cool because it has these little videos. So here's something that talks about blending. It's just a quick little illustration to kind of show you how to do that. And then I think you just click off the screen to get off of that. It's another kind of weird thing about the touch screen. There's not necessarily a back arrow, but if you just kind of touch off of the pop-up box, then you'll get off of that screen. So there's different tips and things there. And that's really, uh, well, actually you do use the three dots for um, emailing. One of the cool things you can do with this program is you can actually create something and then email it to yourself. And so I have it set to not save people's emails or anything like that. We're not using those emails. Um, but that's kind of a cool feature. So over here, this is your toolbar. And this has everything that you need for painting and, you know, making a basic painting. Um, and you can actually, you can move it around too, although 
I hate this trackpad on this computer. I can't get it to move. But on the iPad, you just touch it, and you can slide it around. Um, so this is your brushes, and you just tap that brush, and then you get this pull-down menu that you can scroll through just by dragging with your finger. Um, and you have all these different pencils and brushes and things like that. Um, pencils, pens, calligraphy, I mean, look at all this stuff. So there's a watercolor one right here. And what my instructions say is just to start with this heavy wash. And then, so this is your brushes. This is like a blender, I think. Um, this is your size of your brush. So you have quite a bit of control there. And then the angle of the brush, I mean, this gets crazy. Um, this dot right here that is black right now is your color. And that's one of the things that I think people are going to question. Like, where's the color? I can't see it because it's black right there. Like, it doesn't look like there's any color. But that's your color. And then you can just move this around in the center for your sort of light and dark values. And then slide this around the edge to choose your color. So that's pretty easy to do. And then once you've, once you've got your, your color and how bright or how deep you want it, then you can just, you can just kind of start painting. And it will, um, if you go slow, I mean, it really acts a lot like paint. Um, this color is really light, so I don't even know if you can see it, but you're, you're just filling things in. It's, it's really, really fun. So when you go faster, you know, it does different effects. Um, anyway, that's, that's that. Those are the two, like the main thing is like the brush and the color. I don't think too many people are going to get crazy with this, but you can change the opacity. You can change the flow. Softness, I haven't played with softness before. This is a, I think that's a blender. Let me see, where's my color? Where'd my color go? Um, yeah, let's just put some pink down. Okay. Need. I think I might have had the wrong side. Anyway, you can put another color up next to that one and like blend them together. See, you can, you can smear things. People are going to do all kinds of, you know, weird things. We can make this totally unrecognizable as Moran. Like some abstract thing. Um, oh, down here there's an undo. And once you've undone something, then you'll see a redo over here. And it allows you like 200 undos or something like that. Like it has a, a limit, um, which is kind of fun. So this goes through how to select a canvas. Okay, so if you're done with that, say that's, oh, I love that. I want to email that to myself. You click on these three dots. You click on export. I might have to follow my own instructions here. It's been a while since I've done it. But, yep, export. Mm -hmm. It'll... You know, you can name it if you want to. You can choose an image file. I put on here just PNG is fine. Um, and then create. I might not have this one set up. Usually there's another pop-up box that says mail, and that's where you type in your um, email and stuff. Anyway, to leave your project, there's a little um, house button up here that'll take you back home, and then you'll see your project right here, and it'll say project or whatever name you gave it. If you want to delete it, you just long press it, so you just push on it for a second, and then the pop-up it says delete, you click that, click yes, and it goes away. And sometimes the app crashes like that, which is awesome. <laughs> the iPad doesn't seem to crash as much as this computer. 
and it's always in that that step this computer crashes. It's really annoying. Um, so the other thing you can do is to yes, I know it did. Thank you. Um, to click right here, this blank canvas. That'll just give you a blank canvas, and actually you can change the color of the paper too, which is kind of cool. But right here, you can choose some sort of tinted papers. I like that a lot. And that'll just give you a blank thing to work with. Same steps. See, that's a really light pencil. And with the, um, the stylus, the Apple stylus, it's, it's touch sensitive. So if you um, press really lightly, you'll get a light line, just like a pencil. If you push darker, you'll get a darker line. So it's, it's pretty cool. Now there's an eraser. <laughs> Have you had a lot of people using that? I think so. I've, I mean, every time I walk through there, I feel like somebody's checking it out. Um, one thing I have not done yet is, you know, see if people are actually deleting their projects when they're done. In the instructions, it, you know, kind of recommends that, like, please delete it, <laughs> um, because we don't have hours to spend every day deleting, deleting projects. But um, I'm curious to, to go out there and see what people are doing with it. Um, we can also, like, I can look and see if people, if people are sending emails. Um, like I said, I'm not keeping those email addresses or anything like that, but I can see if people are doing that, which is kind of a nice, a nice way to track engagement in and the these gallery. Directions are sitting yeah, so the directions, there's, there are two iPads, one on each bench, and we have it kind of set up to be right-handed and left-handed, although you can be right-handed on the left-handed side and vice versa, but we're thinking of all you lefties. Um, and the um, instructions, I think, think are, I don't know if they're tethered or not, I can't remember if they're just sitting on the bench or if they're actually connected to something. I think I feel like they might just be sitting there. But there's two copies, there's one on each bench. So, so check that out when you uh, when you get a chance and play with it. That really is a cool app. Do it you, really do you is. know when that was um, created? I don't know. I at least a few, it's at least a few years old, but it's not super old. Okay. I'm thinking maybe even like 2017, but I don't know why that number sticks in my head. And sorry, what's it called again? It's called Infinite Painter. Okay, is that something you just download on your phone? Mm -hmm. So there is a free version, you can use it on your phone, it's a little small, um, <laughs> yeah. but you can do it. Um, there's, a, there's a free version that's pretty good, and the full version's only like 10 bucks. Okay. So, yeah. 10 bucks total? 10 bucks. Mm-hmm. And I think even that ten with that ten dollar purchase allows you to download it on your iPad and your phone and your desktop all with one that one purchase. Some apps make you you know, they're different formats and they're different things. But yeah, the stylus <laughs> yeah. The Apple pencil I think they're about a hundred bucks. Yeah. But you can use it with your finger too. You don't have to use the stylus, but it does have a nice, you know, usability to it. It really feels like the real thing. Um this was like, oh, the other thing that I bought for these iPads is a, a screen protector that actually helps make it feel like paper. So it's not, it doesn't feel like you're writing on glass so much. It feels like there's a little bit of a tooth there, like, like paper. And that was a really cheap little addition, too. Um, yeah, really fun. <laughs> Any questions on all that? I don't know. <laughs> I'm pretty direct, you know. I like using the real stuff. <laughs> yeah, I do. I do too. But this really was. Um, this is a fun app. Any questions on it or? Okay, cool. We're pretty much out of time here. Um, the last thing that I had on my agenda, if there was time to talk about, I'll just mention briefly, just so that you're aware that staff did a training with the Jackson Hole Police Department and like some um, law enforcement from the Park Service and the Forest Service and things like that on an active shooter situation training. Not much fun. Um, I have information on it, I guess, if anyone wants to hear what they said. Um, we were kind of limited to the amount of people that I could invite to that training, so, and I, 
it's again it's not fun so I didn't really want to make it a volunteer training but if you want to hear about it I'm happy to share that information with you I really won't go into it today because we're we're out of time but